But of course, at the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, Charles Leclerc, when leading in a you know great position, very fast car, we, as we saw in qualifying, even though it wasn't the greatest start to the race, he was in a, a very, very good position. The Red Bulls absolutely in that Grand Prix were going to come back at Leclerc and Ferrari and possibly still win the Grand Prix, even if Leclerc didn't have the issue that he had with his car. But once again, in you know the races we've had in the last two or three weeks, Ferrari have completely destroyed Charles Leclerc's chances of winning the Grand Prix, but also pulling out a good lead in the Drivers' Championship over Max Verstappen. And that is a big reason why Max Verstappen currently leads the championship. And what we're going to do here is look at, of course, the start of the season and how it looks so good and so easy, the Ferrari team, um, after the first three Grand Prix, and then look just how it fell apart. And also look at, going forward, how Ferrari can fix this reliability uh, problem they have at the moment. And also look at the damage that has been done in terms of the championship and what the champion sh uh, championship standing sorry, would look like if Ferrari weren't such clowns. So let's now get into it. So in Bahrain, first Grand Prix of the season, of course, he, uh, Charles Leclerc, got a, a, just an absolutely brilliant victory. Wasn't the biggest surprise the way he won. We know he is very quick around the Bahrain International, or the Sakir, sorry, uh, International Circuit. We've seen him... Uh, do very, very well there in the past. Of course, pole position back in 2019. And we knew coming into that weekend after uh, after sorry the um, end of testing, we knew that Ferrari had a very, very good car for 2022. And he proved it by getting a relatively comfortable victory. Max Verstappen did give it his best go, but Charles Leclerc was just so, so good in that Grand Prix. Kept his head and got a very very good victory. Of course, in Saudi Arabia, Verstappen would respond with a victory of his own. But of course, Verstappen did retire in that Bahrain Grand Prix. And after Max Verstappen retired yet again in the Australian Grand Prix, Charles Leclerc went on to take probably the most dominant win for the Ferrari team in a very, very long time. And after this Grand Prix, there was plenty of people online and in the community thinking, you know what, this really could be, including myself, by the way, there was plenty of people thinking, this really could be Ferrari's year because their pace was incredible. They were miles quicker than any other team. Red Bull were way behind the Ferrari team that weekend. Charles Leclerc would pull his championship lead out to a very healthy one at the, or just after the Australian Grand Prix. And here is what it looked like in the top five of the championship when he did win that Australian Grand Prix. He was leading by a massive margin of 34 points to the next car. The next car wasn't even Max Verstappen. Uh, it was George Russell and the Mercedes. And we know the Mercedes car has been very slow uh, this season. Carlos Sainz was in third. Perez fourth. Hamilton fifth. Verstappen not even in the top five of the championship at this point. After the first three Grand Prix, he was only about two or three points, I believe, behind Lewis Hamilton. And at this point, I'm not going to lie, obviously, at, the, at that time, I wasn't able to do content because I had internet problems. But I thought after this Grand Prix, you know what, if Leclerc wins the next race and Verstappen has another, you know, non-podium or a retirement, then I think the championship could be done already. Um, so, yeah, was looking... Very, very good for them. And even though we knew Ferrari from the past had in their locker the possibility to throw away good results, at this point, I still thought, you know what? Even though they have that in their locker, their car is that good, they might still be able to win the championship from such a good point. And I definitely did not think that, you know, after about three or four races, they would fall to this point. I thought it would take at least two or three months for Red Bull to not even take the lead of the championship, but get, you know, within 20 points of Leclerc uh, in the driver's standings and for Red Bull to close the gap to Ferrari in the constructor standings. So Ferrari, like I said, we're in an absolutely brilliant position in Australia. But obviously, after this Grand Prix, the tables were turned at 
Imola, where Charles Leclerc, after a competitive weekend still, but not the best weekend they were hoping for, he was running in third place behind the two Red Bulls who just had the better speed that particular weekend. He, you know, pushing very, very hard, tried to close down and hunt down Sergio Perez towards the end of the Grand Prix, and of course, made a big mistake towards the end of the lap over the uh, final chicane curbs, and was very lucky not to crash out fully of the Grand Prix, would come home to finish in sixth place and lose about seven points from his Grand Prix. Or I think it might have been actually six points because I think he got the fastest lap of the Grand Prix as he was coming back through. But even though this was a disappointing Grand Prix and Charles Leclerc was definitely the reason why it was a lot worse than it should have been, this was and is to this point the only mistake Charles Leclerc has made that has actually had a proper effect on the results that Ferrari have had this season. Joel Leclerc even admitted, of course, after the Grand Prix, you know, it was his mistake, pushed too hard, and he will try not to do it again. And since then, hasn't done so. And you have to say, as we'll get onto in a moment, when it comes to the blame game and the blame share, Charles Leclerc doesn't really take that much of it. Yeah, he'll take some for this, but for everything else, you would have to pin it on the Ferrari team. Then we went to Miami. Not that bad of a defeat for them in Miami. Red Bull, I think, had the faster car that weekend. Ferrari didn't really make any mistakes. Of course, they got the front row lockout. Benefited, of course, from Max Verstappen making a mistake on his final running qualifying. And Verstappen proved then in the race that the Red Bull was the better car for that circuit. But, like I said, it wasn't a bad defeat. They just weren't quick enough, uh, which does happen in championship fights. You can't win every single Grand Prix and only lose... Um, you know, some Grand Prix based on no mistakes. Sometimes you just lose a Grand Prix because you're not quick enough. But going into the next two races in Spain and Monaco, because of the layouts, we knew going into those races that Ferrari would be the favourites and would have, without a doubt, the best car for those tracks. And it proved to be the case. Leclerc on pole in Spain by three and a half. Was it three and a half tenths? Or it was three tenths of a second, I think, in Barcelona and had a pretty good pole position as well in Monaco. And Ferrari actually locked out the front row in Monaco as well. And if you had told me after the Miami Grand Prix that Leclerc and Ferrari would be in those positions, I would say, really, that it should have been two wins from those Grand Prix, even though there is still possibility that Red Bull could have responded had it not been for Ferrari's own failures, as we'll get into in a second. It's very hard, you know, most of the time, if you look at the history of, uh, you know, starting on pole position from those circuits, it's very hard to lose a victory uh, from pole position. But of course, at the Spanish Grand Prix, after Max Verstappen as well made a very big mistake, Charles Leclerc had his race destroyed by the first of a very costly Ferrari engine failure. Like I said, Max Verstappen made a mistake, um, in the first, I think, was it 15 laps of the Grand Prix going off at turn four? Obviously, Carlos Sainz did that as well. But Leclerc, by the time his retirement came, which I think was about lap 30-ish, leading the race he was by 13 seconds. He was going to win the race by an absolute mile and probably get the fastest lap as well. But then, obviously, his engine stopped. Uh, well, it got him far enough to get to the pits, but it was absolutely destroyed. And Max Verstappen eventually took the victory. And Red Bull got a 1-2. And that is the Grand Prix where Red Bull officially got the lead of the championship. So at this point, Ferrari are now massively under pressure to respond in Monaco. And they did with a front row lockout in qualifying. But as I covered in my video a couple weeks ago, which I'm sure will be in the description box down below if you want to watch how Ferrari lost the Monaco Grand Prix. They did it in typical Ferrari style. Red Bull tried to force Ferrari into a mistake on strategy, and that's exactly what they did. They pitted Leclerc one lap too late for the intermediate tyres and actually gave Carlos Sainz the best strategy uh, option out of them all, which is a very weird decision because... Why would you not give Leclerc that when obviously he's the number one of the team in the lead and obviously leading the drivers' championship? So 
at, you know, made absolutely no sense there. And obviously, Leclerc eventually, and after getting held up behind Carlos Sainz pitting for dry tyres, he would finish eventually Leclerc in fourth place and lose a boatload of points again and lose the win of the Monaco Grand Prix that he so much desired. And Ferrari completely took it away from him and destroyed it for him. A terrible strategy decision from that race. But like I said, if you want to watch a bit more in depth how it all happened, then uh, you can by uh, watching the video in the description about that. But coming to Baku, obviously, Ferrari, you know, they still do have a quick car. We have to remember that. And in, pole, uh, in qualifying, Leclerc got a very good pole position. Three tenths of a second clear of the rest of the field. And it looked as though, even though Red Bull, we knew we were going to be very quick in the race, we knew that Leclerc and Ferrari still had like a 40, 50% chance, probably at best, to win the Grand Prix. So we knew there was still a very good opportunity there for Ferrari to bounce back and to try and get Leclerc back into the championship uh, against Max Verstappen and uh, Red Bull also in the Constructors' Championship. But at the start... Sergio Perez got a better start than Leclerc. Leclerc also locked up his inside front, which definitely hurt his pace in the first stint of the Grand Prix. Max Verstappen would be all over the back of him, um, as we can see here in the first uh, 10 to 15 laps. And it looked as though it was only a matter of time until Max Verstappen overtook him. But then the virtual safety car came out because Carlos Sainz had uh, his car stop on track or just off the track for a technical problem with his car and ferrari made the smart decision i think to pit his car it was the best decision they could have made because it gave ferrari the best opportunity i believe to win the race because if they stayed out i think red bull would have had a probably an easier road to victory of course if leclerc had remained in the grand prix and then once uh, you know the two Red Bulls pitted, Leclerc was comfortably in the lead. Obviously, the Red Bulls were now coming back at Leclerc in terms of lap time and were starting to close down the gap. But Leclerc, you know, he had the advantage at that point at the Grand Prix and, like I said, was leading comfortably. And then this happened. About, what, lap 20, lap 21, his engine blew to smithereens, a classic engine blow-up like we've seen back in the V10 days. And he was out of the race. And that made a double retirement for the Ferrari team. And because of that double retirement and Red Bull getting a 1-2 in the Grand Prix, that means for sure the Constructors' Championship is wrapped up. Because we know if Ferrari, you know, they do have a very fast car, of course. But if they can't hold on to a 46-point lead and they, you know, concede about 70-odd points to Red Bull over the course of five races, there's no way they're going to close in on Red Bull in the constructor standings. And for the driver's side, it has made things very difficult now for Charles Leclerc because now he has to continue driving, obviously, like he has for the last four or five races, which is basically perfectly, but also hope that his team can at least give him a chance of actually winning a race rather than teasing him about the possibility of winning a Grand Prix, which is essentially what they are doing at the moment but after that retirement this is how it has left things in the championship max verstappen is now leading on 150 points sergio perez is second now overtaking leclerc on 129 points and charles leclerc 34 points behind that's not dead and buried and i do have to emphasize that i don't think his hopes are over i don't think the championship is over but I think it's mostly over at this point. Because like I said, if Ferrari can't do enough to help him keep a 46-point lead that he had only two months ago, then I don't see how he's now going to reverse this back into, you know, winning the World Championship later this season. I just don't see um, how they can help him. But I'm going to still give him a chance because he is still close enough to be given still a chance in the championship and of course you never know red bull could retire for the next race and leclerc win it and then that would close things up right uh again um but yeah leclerc now a massive deficit on that side 
And in the Constructors Championship, it is now almost 100 points in Red Bull's favour. And given how strong Red Bull are this season, how, how strong their driver lineup is, I think it's done, really, in the Constructors Championship. But what I'm going to get on to now, quickly, before we go to a news article, is what the Championship standings would look like if Ferrari had not cost Leclerc the Spanish, Monaco, and Azerbaijan Grand Prix. This doesn't include, um, you know, me altering the standings for, you know, the mistake at Imola. I've kept, you know, the points loss that he had there. I've kept that in because I'm more so focusing on the points that Ferrari have cost Charles Leclerc rather than just an overall, you know, what points have been dropped that shouldn't have been dropped for the championship effort so let's now get into that and you're going to be very surprised how many points have been lost and how it would actually look if ferrari were a competent team here it is this is how the championship standings would look if leclerc had won the spanish grand prix won the monaco grand prix and had finished second at least in baku uh, that's what the championship standings that I've altered account for. I personally, I still think Verstappen would have won on the fresher tyres, but even if after, say, Leclerc, let's say he had won in Spain and Monaco, even if Max had won in Baku yesterday with Leclerc second, Charles Leclerc would still have a 33 point lead. And of course, it's 20, well, it's 25 points plus a point for. Uh, race win and obviously fastest lap so that's still a pretty comfortable gap to have if he did have it at this point of the season that's how drastically different it would be if Charles Leclerc was driving for a more competent outfit than Ferrari if it was any other team well maybe not any other team but if it was a Mercedes or a Red Bull team that had the type of car Ferrari do and Leclerc was driving for them it would probably look like this Leclerc still dominantly leading the championship and probably if he was in this position he would be the favorite to win his first world title and Ferrari's first world title in 14 years just <sighs> disgraceful absolutely disgraceful on the part of Ferrari what they have done to Leclerc's championship charge now I'll just move back to some pictures here and I'll quickly go to a news article uh, about Ferrari and their reliability to show how it's not all it's not all good, let's say, at the Ferrari team on that side. So let me just quickly show this. Now this is from Automotor Sport in uh, Germany. Obviously, they're a great uh, publication, probably the best when it comes to Formula One, and massive credit to them for what they do. And there's a couple bits in this article that I just want to read out that uh, I thought was uh, quite interesting. So they talk about uh, first power, then reliability. And it says, Ferrari was able to pack up after 21 laps. Carlos Sainz had parked his car in the ninth lap with a damaged hydraulic system uh, off the track. Uh, what was once the hallmark of the F175 has been reversed. And what they mean by that was the reliability advantage they had over Red Bull after what we saw in um in melbourne bonotto there's a quote from him here saying reliability is a construction site you didn't you don't win races without it i don't want to blame our technicians um they did an excellent job with the drivetrain if you look back at where we came from we did last year with a hybrid system and this winter uh made huge leaps in performance with the engine and it looks like we're paying the price now and then it says, because the tech for the combustion uh, engine was frozen at the end of February and the hybrid system has to be homologated at the end of September, it was obvious for Ferrari to first look at the power and performance development. Uh, they wanted to take care of the stability later if necessary. The regulations allow for corrections to be made if you can prove uh, to the FIA that it's all about ensuring stability. There was also, I think, another bit of this article that we may also get to in a second that uh, did actually, well, maybe it's not from this article, but there was also a little story that was put out there yesterday uh, in Baku 
or from the Baku Grand Prix, that Ferrari have asked the FIA if they can make a alteration to their power unit for reliability reasons, and they've been rejected. So, not great for them. And then it says here about the MG UK being a vulnerability. And then it says, the unanimous opinion is that the Ferrari engine has the most power in the field, 4 kilowatts more than Honda, 8 more than Mercedes, and 12 more than Renault. Much more important, however, is the lead in drivability. And then it says about how Toto Wolf thinks that the drivability of the Ferrari uh, power unit is a class above. Uh, but then it says that the class leader has a major disadvantage. It's not bulletproof. The higher the mileage, the greater the concern. Customers... Notice that too. Haas driver Kevin Magnussen, obviously Ferrari-powered uh, car that is, received his third MG UK in Baku, and then he obviously retired in the race. That's what caused the second virtual safety car. Uh, this time there was a crash between the turbocharger and the MG UH, and Magnussen will likely need a third unit from both components in Montreal. Bottas already has them. Leclerc uh, it says we'll probably also reach the maximum of three units in Canada with some components in the drive. He and his teammates signs are already using the uh, two units of the combustion engine, turbocharger, MGUH, and uh, I think it's supposed to see MGUK there, or maybe it's supposed to say that, or have used them up completely. So far, Ferrari has made ends meet by putting together a patchwork of still functioning components from different drive units. That's no longer enough so essentially what that article says is that because of the the power unit freeze on development ferrari coming into 2022 firstly focused on outright power and performance when normally they would focus firstly probably on reliability that has cost them because now they're trying to focus all their efforts on reliability but they have less time to do it. Obviously, it's not great to be trying to fix reliability during the season and, you know, work on that. And they've already had a request to try and make an upgrade to their power unit for reliability reasons rejected by the FIA. So not looking good for Ferrari and for Charles Leclerc, even though he hasn't been absolutely bulletproof this season, he has been very, very good this season. Even though Verstappen, you know, leading the championship, and I think you'd have to say Max Verstappen has been, in terms of the championship contenders, the better driver, it's very close between the two, a lot closer than the championship standings would have it. And if Charles Leclerc was able to just drive for a competent racing team, then maybe Charles Leclerc this season, if he was driving for one, would be the world champion. But at the moment, it is not looking good. Let me know, guys, in the comments section down below. Do you think, after what's happened in the uh, you know the races so far, and especially after the Australian Grand Prix, let me know, do you think it's over for Charles Leclerc? If you don't think it's over and you think he still has a chance, let me know why you think that is and how you think Ferrari can you know somehow get him back into the mix in the standings. Let me know how you think that could happen. And yeah, Charles Leclerc, I feel so sorry for him. Yet another Grand Prix absolutely robbed from his hands.